Uh, kia ora everybody. It's really great to be here. I found it so inspiring. And I hope that what I'm talking about will make connections with other um, presentations that we've heard, including the most recent one about issues of speech and voice. Uh, so I'm not giving, uh, presenting a paper. I'm really talking about some ideas and the starting point for that was a dilemma in which I've, a quite a paralysing dilemma, I realise as I've been sitting here um, today and yesterday, that I found with my own research. So one of the things that has really struck me today, listening to people and the way people have talked about themselves, is that, um, you know, as Shiv indicated, um, you know, there is not a simple <laughs> distinction between an academic and an activist. I mean, there are certainly academics that are not activists and vice versa. But, you know, many of the people here are in various ways activists, academics, different kinds of practitioners that are all those things. They're also teachers. Um, and also, I just want to, you know, introduce um, the vexed but important term of an intellectual. So you are an activist and an intellectual. You might at some point be an academic and so on. And I see myself as primarily a feminist, and I guess I would say a feminist intellectual as well as an activist and I think doing intellectual work can be activism it isn't always but it can be and it's perhaps inseparable you could say from certain kinds of activism so I would I was a feminist um, before I was an academic during and after and also an activist before during and after as well and that's true for many of us in different ways so I'm really against that idea of a split also, ironically, like a number of people here, I'm located within a business school. And um, as opposed to, say, an arts faculty where I did my original degrees. Um, and one of the ironies there is we're being encouraged to engage with practice and practitioners all the time in a very certain kind of way. But we are. So in, a, in an ironic sense, um, you know, the split between working where I do and engaging sort of, as you might say, out there or as some people like to say, the real world, um, it's, it's seen really differently. So that's some of where I'm located. And also some of my, my recent work, I would say, has really been looking at inequality within the university and especially sexism and racism. And when I say racism, the place of the treaty in the university. So that's the way I've thought about it, and I'm interested in inequality between academics, and you know, one of my, I guess, enduring frustrations is the critical work that is done by academics that do not look at their own location within the university. And sometimes it's actually uncomfortable as it may be, more comfortable to engage with activists outside the university than to actually be an activist inside your university, biting the hand that feeds you. It is uncomfortable in a certain kind of way. So that's where I'm coming from. So I'm suspicious of, you know, the we. Um, there isn't really a we. There's, like here, there's a group of people that are interested in considering certain issues. But as, you know, let's say academics, there's not really... It's a very variegated we with, a, you know, tremendous differences in terms of power relations and privilege and disadvantage. And, and I, I was really interested in not here, but okay. talking about Auckland University, you know, that with, you know, the university is those cleaners that have now been outsourced, you know, it's everybody, um, and just thinking about that I think is a powerful um, approach. So what we see here are film, is a film crew, and my work in recent times has been about um, film work and film workers, and this is my starting point for my dilemma, and so these are the, the you know the living bodies of film workers, um, people, human beings um, who have sometimes interviewed and written about, and that's thrown up some tremendous political dilemmas for me. And I want to work through some of those a bit. So I thought about the idea of of being a traitor and the idea of betrayal, because as people have indicated in various ways, we might be serving or betraying the university. Uh, we might be serving or betraying activists with whom we might, or on whom or to whom we might be doing research, for instance. So what would constitute service or betrayal? Because I think for a lot of us, um, you know, people have spoken very passionately, and I especially noticed that in the, the session to sessions today, about their commitment. So there's a service here. So drawing out who are we serving, and what are the, I guess, the contradictions between some of the service and the specificities. So who are we? So like, who am I in Wellington? Pākehā woman, feminist, academic, 
people working in Wellington, film industry plays a certain part in the sort of imaginary of Wellington, the economy of Wellington, um, and in New Zealand of course too. So talking of traitors, I want to start off by talking briefly about Mike Joy. So people will um, know who Mike Joy is, I guess, he's an ecological scientist um, working at Massey University and, and who has been called a traitor uh, in recent times and I want to tease out a bit of that before I talk about my situation. So first of all, um, this is John Key's reaction to press reports where uh, Mike Joy was in effect positioned so that he was, and, and you know, really did contest the concept of 100% pure, clean, green New Zealand. So John Key said, when he was confronted, and he was, you know, um, rather caught out on a, um, on a British um, television programme with the claim that New Zealand isn't clean and green or 100% pure, and many native species were close to extinction, and 90% of New Zealand's lowland rivers and that of half of all lakes are polluted, he disagreed. That's Mike Joy's view, but I don't share that view. He's one academic, and like lawyers, I can provide you with another one that would give a counter view. Quite a famous comment of John Keyes in terms of the way that he's thinking about academics. So what might the response to that be, and what are some other comments that were made? So another intervention was by someone called... Um, Mark Unsworth, he's a, a consultant lobbyist that works in Wellington, and he wrote a, um, some rather rude um, emails late at night to Mike Joy that were leaked by Russell Norman uh, on Facebook, and he said, letting your ego run right worldwide in the manner that you did, he spoke, he was interviewed by um, American journalists, letting your ego run right worldwide in the manner you did can only lead to lower levels of inbound tourism. <laughs> You may not care given your tenure in a nice, comfy university lounge, but to others this affects income and jobs, he wrote. Give that some thought next time you feel the need to see your name in print in New York and possibly think of changing your name from joy to misery. It's more accurate. <laughs> so there's actually a lot of things there here that we've already discussed, I think, in the last day or so, which is, first of all, um, it's not only um, business people that attack academics for having tenure in nice, comfy university lounges. And um, academic life is seen by those outside academic life um, in many different ways, but among others as a place of privilege. And um, and this, I think, this is important that she was raising this point about well, you know um, who do intellectuals serve, and is there a role for intellectuals? Is there a role for academics? You know, are they meant to be um, supporting the tourism industry? Are they meant to be uh, supporting a certain kind of social activism? Um, does the fact that they have got secure jobs make them bad people, and so on and so on. So it's interesting that the terms of critique here are some of the terms of critique that activists would also um, bring against um, academics, which is that you can just sit there and you don't have to think about us. I also look at income and jobs, and you know, activists are also very interested in income and jobs, and... I'm often reminded of the kind of West Coast um, contest that's pos positioned as something like mining versus ecology. Of course, you know, there's lots of problems with that bifurcation, but, you know, this idea of these are our jobs, it's all very well for you because you're not affected, but we are, it's our jobs, and people feel passionately about that. Um, so these are some of the terms of critique of Mike Joy. Um, so... Uh, Mike when Joy responded, um, if he wants to have a go at somebody, he should have a go at those who are polluting our rivers, not the guy researching it, he said. I'm pretty disgusted. I've been quoted in this article commenting on the state of the environment, and people have called me a traitor to this country. I'm just the one doing the research. Well, you know, my guess is that many people in this room, probably all of us would be like on Mike Joy's side here, but... It's interesting, I'm just the one doing the research. So, you know, if we were criticised by social activists, would it be okay for us to say, I'm just the one doing research, don't blame me? You know, it's actually not that simple. Uh, Key goes on to say, New Zealanders had to be careful not to run the country down with research, which might not be factually correct. So I think factually correct is really important here, because this implies that if it was factually correct, things might be different. And this is where we have the institution of science and the way it appears in a certain kind of way, which is really probably quite different from a lot of the work that a lot of us would do and our truth claims. So, 
Um, Mike Joy is backed by the New Zealand Association of Scientists and they, they said, the clear statement is the potential damage to New Zealand's reputation economic benefit of big spending American tourists outweighs the need for truth in public debate. This is an issue the association takes very seriously. So this is the question of truth and we have the paradigm of the scientist as I suppose the academic par excellence in a way. They just find out the objective truth and the rest of us can kind of do what we like with that truth but you know they are the truth givers. Uh, so you know to me there are a lot of problems with that um, and one of the problems of course for someone like me or and many people here is that we don't um, tend to produce research on the whole that would have um, the aura of truth, like scientific objective truth. So for some of the work that we might want to do in terms of social activism, it's hard to do that. Some statistical work can have that kind of um, authority of truth, but a lot of what we want to do isn't like that. So what I'm saying here is that in the defence of Mike Joy and in the story of science versus politics or um, the truth about pollution versus tourism, there are some key themes about what academic truth is, and a lot of those key themes we can't actually really use when we're thinking about um, social research. So, the idea of betrayal and patriotism. So, I'm drawing here for some work um, on um, how Russell Coots was seen as a New Zealand hero, then seen as a traitor when he went off went off to a Switzerland where he was um, it was paid large amounts of money, apparently a bad thing, in order to um, be part of, of, of another country's um, yachting um, project. So, and he talks about patriotism, a betrayal or being a traitor as the refusal to serve the compulsory demands of the national we. So what is that national we? Um, or, for that matter, who is the we that are concerned with social justice? Who is that we that we might serve? Um, who, who does issue those demands? And how do we know what is service and what is betrayal? Uh, also, this we is um, constituted as a New Zealand story. I'll see if I can really quickly and easily bring up... Yeah, I'll see if I can really quickly and easily bring up this um, link... And yeah, hooray, good. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are aware of the work that's been done, in particular by New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, on the New Zealand story. But um, this is just their, um, their opening page, and they have, um, I'll show you, um, I think, I hope to find it here, the, the chapters. Um, and they have, and then they talk about Oh, here we are, Open Hearts, New Zealanders, they've got Open Hearts. And then they go on to tell various stories about the Open Hearts of New Zealanders together with um, visuals of that. Genuine Care for the Land is another one. See, nice um, Māori people exerting kaiti akitanga. Um, and so on. So you get the idea. This, these are very familiar images for us. This is um, a story that's been carefully crafted for policy purposes by New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, but you can see it, it includes um, tourism, and our Prime Minister is the Minister of Tourism, a, a, a low-paid um, low um, industry um, to which New Zealand is being shoveled. Um, and this story has been crafted to um, provide a message within which New Zealand policy and um, the image of New Zealand um, has to be has to be constrained by, and um, the people that are a part of putting together this New Zealand story include a right, wide range of people, not just from government, but from various business sectors. Let's see if I can close that down. So, okay. So what I'm emphasising here is there is an official New Zealand story. A lot of been work, work has been put into it in the last few years, and in, it includes tourism, and in my case, and importantly, it includes film and. Mike Joy has been caught up in this story um, because he's told another story, which is not okay, and um, also in a different way. I've been caught up in the story and so have many others. So, uh, briefly, um, thinking about what betrayal is and the critical attitude, 
So giving an account of the interlocutory um, conditions whereby one is asked to give an account of oneself or ask others to give an account of themselves. This is Judith Butler's work and she argues that the political ethical situation that we're in, um, part of thinking about it, to think about is what are the conditions whereby we ask other people to tell us their stories and we've been talking about that, how people feel ripped off and pissed off. They feel ripped off and pissed off when you present back to them a story about themselves that they don't recognise as them. Um, but also the accounts that we give of ourselves. So what I want to do is just work through, um, I've talked about Mike Joy briefly, and I just want to talk a bit through, um, oh, someone's online. Yes, I hope they're not going to suddenly pop up and Skype us. Okay, so, so the work that I've been doing is about working workers in the film industry, and I should say that I'm part of a group of, of four along with my colleague Judith Pringle um, at AUT and um, our colleagues Ellie Henry and Rachel Wolfgram who specifically looked at Māori screen production. Okay, so, however, the key thing is we interviewed people that were, that were um, basically um, film workers, in other words, not so much the famous directors, producers and so on, but what we could say crew, broadly speaking. Okay, we produced some work regarding that and we were attacked... Um, by um, John Barnett, who's uh, a very big fish in New Zealand. Being a small country, very big fish, very small ponds can have a huge amount of influence. Um, second only perhaps to Peter Jackson and Richard Taylor, um, John Barnett, very successful producer. So, so I just want to think about the critique that he made of the work that we did. The thing that I haven't shown here is, first of all, he criticised us because um, the study had taken three years and cost, you know, pay a certain amount of money, and he said that it could all be done in a week and it was completely ridiculous to take three years over it. So um, that would be a very common criticism that, um, of the research that we do that could also be made by um, activists, which would be how come academics um, spend all this money and take all this time, you know, taxpayers' money, basically, doing research. If they're going to do that, well, who's that research for? Should it just be for them to enhance their careers and publish impenetrable journal articles? So again, the kind of critique that was coming from John Barnett would be quite similar to the kind of critique we might hear from others. So okay, so first of all, then he goes on to say that um, what we came up with was no secret. So first of all, the kind of statement that we made, this was via our universities and media people, very difficult uh, trying to explain studies to media people and to produce little blips uh, for the university. So um, we talked about um, the exploitative nature and the complexity of the exploitative nature in particular of film work. So in other words, people work in extremely precarious conditions, they work for extremely long hours, um, there are many problems. So first of all, it's no secret. So this is often the case with practitioners, and we might include social activists or film producers here. People get pissed off if you tell them something they already know because it's no secret and they could have told you that. So in other words, if you say what they would say, that, that just goes to show that you're useless. But on the other hand, um, and then he went on to say that's not something you should complain about and that would be the difference between him and me. They both, we both agree on the situation, we, we disagree about whether that's something you should complain about. Okay, so that's the other thing. You know, and so what right do I have? You know, I'm not in the industry. What right do I have to complain about something? So early on, for instance, when I was doing this work, um, a draft or something that I'd written was circulated to someone at Film New Zealand. Film New Zealand is the organisation that um, tries to get people to come here and make movies. And I got a complaint. You shouldn't publish stuff like this. People won't want to come and make movies here. So the assumption, therefore, is that if you're an academic and doing research, you should be doing it for the industry. And like the university, the industry tends to be the producers, basically. So there are a number of assumptions here about what research should do. So should it be, should it be there to serve the industry? Um, so let's say that I want to say that I, my, I wanted my work to serve the workers. Then that's my other problem. So, okay, good. That's great. Okay, so if I was thinking about this in relation to a social movement, 
what social movement would this be? So some of you, and if you were in Wellington at the time, would be particularly aware of um, the furore that erupted uh, in Wellington when it seemed, and I say seemed, because it wasn't even the case, that the work of The Hobbit would be taken out of Wellington, or in fact New Zealand, and go somewhere else. That was never going to happen, as it later transpired. Um, an industrial relations furore broke out. A tremendous amount of tension, which we actually as researchers were very aware of as we'd gone about doing our research. A tremendous amount of tension between um, employers, workers, different groups of workers, in this case the actors as opposed to, we might say, the techos, um, New Zealand, Warner Brothers, global labour, this all kind of erupted and came to a head. And those of you who will recall the National Party's rationale for changing the law, so we're kind of a certain kind of um, economic zone whereby um, people weren't allowed to have any industrial relations rights for the purposes of filmmaking, that all happened in the name of New Zealand. And you may know that the Labour Party in, the, um, in Parliament gets called Hobbit Haters. If you're a Hobbit Hater, that is the worst kind of betrayal you really can... Um, you know, if you're a hobbit hater, that's like the worst. And obviously you're not a patriot. So the role of patriotism here was extremely important. And it was very significant that, um, the, again, the situation with Mike Joy erupted just before the launch of the hobbit-related um, tourism campaign, which followed this. And um, they were particularly pissed off because they were just poised to launch this. And a number of people have written about this in New Zealand, done really interesting work. So um, this march or protest, which I've never written about, it really would be so great to write about, was actually not the workers arising and saying, hell, don't take away our right to organise. Um, it was the workers arising. Um, they were the workers from uh, Weta Workshop, Stone Street Studios and so on who, were, um, who had got work for the first time in ages, many of them, and really high paid work temporarily. Um, Mobilised by Richard Taylor, um, the, um, the head of, of Weta Workshop, and he actually, they actually got together a demonstration and marched through the centre of Wellington. So this was very strange, this was an employer-led demonstration. And again, it really reminded me, because I have had some involvement there, of you know people on the West Coast who feel passionately and violently, and I mean that term, um, when they feel that their, their work is going to be taken away from them. And as against that were um, the actors, and in particular um, several high-profile actors from Actors Equity who were seen as, and, and attacked viciously really, as betraying those others. So we actually had two groups of workers in relation to each other. It was a really complex situation. So it was, this was the very time when we were doing our research, so this was extremely difficult <laughs> for us. Um, well, in fact, for me, because I did the research in Wellington. So, um, for instance, I made a decision not to speak about, out about this issue at all while I was interviewing people. Um, because I felt that um, if I did, that people might not speak to me. Um, I felt quite confused about my role. Um, I wasn't, what the kind of work we were doing was we were doing life history research where we were asking people to talk, really talk about their, their working lives themselves, how they saw themselves and how they saw themselves in relation to the film industry. So we weren't asking them about this issue directly. Um, but I felt um, very caught here, and this I was just thinking about this sort of free area idea that was raised um, earlier today, which, or I think it was yesterday, which is, you know, what... Um, ethical responsibility do we have to the people that we're working with? Now, for me, the ethical responsibility has been a lot clearer in the past when I've worked, or, or like now I'm working with a group in PSA. And I'm pretty clear that we share a political agenda. You know, I still might want to say some different things from what they want me to say, and that is still actually an issue. But primarily, we're, we could say on the same side. But in this case, it was really complex because... I saw these workers as in a situation of uh, tremendous vulnerability. Jocelyn's done work on this as well. Um, and exploitation. And 
as some people say, self-exploitation. In other words, they saw themselves as creatives, they saw themselves as entrepreneurs, they saw themselves as drivers of their own fantastic creative careers. They, um, there was, I mean, actual violence was threatened against actors. People would say things like, actors better not walk down Stone Street, which is, you know, the studios in Miramar. You know, there was just tremendous rage. And it's extremely difficult to then think, you know, how, you know, what was my, what was my position in relation to this? I was, I did feel really quite stuck. So, you know, income and jobs. They were really concerned about their income and jobs, if you can call them jobs, because they're not really. They're short periods of precarious work, but very desirable, and not desirable only um, financially, but because people love to think of themselves as creative. They love to think of themselves as involved in this fabulous national project, which was the brilliance of Peter Jackson, The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and so on. So that, that's the whole sort of glamour, the mystery and the mystique of it. So when I, if I'm thinking about um, my particular work, I might think, well, you know, which social movement what I might, might I be talking about? I mean, I did talk to, to unionists as part of the research that we did. I did do some later work, again, with others, including unionists, about this issue. But in relation to this particular kind of research, I've, fa I've found when I'm giving presentations and I spot one of the people that I interviewed in the audience, I feel very stressed indeed. Uh, and I still do. So, so having a, respect, a respectful relationship with them has been really hard. So I think these questions are just questions for many people. So who to betray and who to serve. So just some suggestions about some a range of positions that we might take. So first of all, carrying out objective true research. This is like a scientist might do. And this might be something that might kind of insulate us from certain kinds of critique. Um, we could do high level analysis which doesn't involve relations with other people. One of my colleagues calls this um, inorganic research. He likes to do this, it's all very high concept and you don't have to actually see in the room with you people that you've been working with who might want to give you shit. Um, Speaking for others, which is complex, and I think you know, you're talking about the difficulty of that. How, I mean, I certainly could not speak for those others. Who could I speak for? Um, and a lot of my own research recently has been participatory because, in a way, at least I'm unclear that I'm speaking for myself. Speaking with others in their voice, um, that might be more like my work with PSA, which is partly participatory, but they get the say, and it's a clear-cut contract might be some kind of advocacy with or for others, in other words, not just producing research, but then leading on to actually be an advocate. You might be finding out stuff for others that are just really, really busy, and what they would like to know is what are the pay statistics for this particular group in this industry. And for them, that's the most valuable research. To me, not exciting or interesting, but for them, the most valuable. And then finally, the consulting, as we might say in the business school, actually giving advice. So, you know, I'd be really interested to know in your thoughts about some of your situations. Um, and, you know, as people have presented here, there's just a range of quite specific ways we need to think about those sets of relationships. Thanks but, very much. So, yeah.